Hi, welcome to The Rock. I'd like to welcome everybody today, and I hope you get a blessing from today's, uh, today's message. We are continuing our, our journey through the Gospel of John, and we, we finished off where we spoke about, in John chapter 15, and Jesus said that you are not of this world. I have taken you out of this world. He spoke to his disciples. And now we're continuing on. We're going to be looking at the Holy Spirit. Now, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, uh, Christians in general have got a, a different idea of the Holy Spirit. You know, we can relate to Father God because we picture Father God as being maybe an old man with gray hair and with lots of wisdom, and, and we picture Jesus walking around with his sandals uh, through the dusty roads. And when it comes to the Holy Spirit, in fact, the, uh, some of the Bibles refer to him as the Holy Ghost, we think of this apparition of this mystical mist or fog or, or, or something, a cloud that, that's around. But in fact, if you can just imagine the Holy Spirit or picture the Holy Spirit as the invisible presence of Jesus. It's the invisible presence of Jesus. All right, so we're going to start with looking at where we left off last week, is, and it's John chapter 15, and we're looking at verse 26. And, and 26 and 27 will bring us up to the end of chapter 15. Then we're going to go into chapter 16. But what we must realize is that although we've got a, a split in chapters, it, Jesus is still carrying on the same conversation. John chapter uh, 15, 26. But when the helper comes, some of the Bibles say when the advocate comes, some will say when the comforter comes. When the helper comes, the word helper, advocate, it's a Greek word, which is parakletos. And parakletos, para means to be alongside, like you get a paratrooper who fights alongside troops. He's a, he flies in, or he drops in for, with, a, with a parachute. You get paramedics who work alongside doctors. And parakletos is a helper who's actually, kletos is a Greek word that means someone who's been invited, a helper, someone who is coming along to aid you. That's why they say, as the, some of the scriptures say the advocate, because an advocate is usually there for your defense and is there to, to be on your side. So it's, a, it's someone who's alongside you, parakletos, someone who is alongside you, who's with you, who is actually defending you, and who is helping you. That's why the it's word helper comes in the New King James Version. But when the helper comes, whom I shall send you from the Father. And that's interesting, whom I shall send you. So the, the Holy Spirit is not an it. It's a, it's, a, it's a whom, it's a who, it's a person. It's another person. We see Father God as a person. We see Jesus as a person. And we see this, the Holy Spirit, which in fact is also the spirit of truth, is a person. This, uh, whom I shall send you the, from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will testify of me, and you will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So who is the Holy Spirit? When he comes, who's he going to testify about? Well, he's going to testify about Jesus. That's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus says. When the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to testify about me. He's going to testify about Jesus. We often think that the Holy Spirit will testify about other people and about us and about it's all about me and about what, what I feel. I can feel the Spirit. I can see this, the Holy Spirit came to testify to, about Jesus Christ because it is the Spirit of truth. Okay, it's not about how you feel and about your emotions and uh, nothing about that. It's his sole purpose was to come along and to testify about Jesus. There's no verse in the Bible that, that, that actually says that the Holy Spirit's come to actually testify about you. It's, it's, that's, that's a misnomer. It's just, it's just not there. And although chapter 16, we're going to go into it now, is a different chapter. We will, we will, it's the same conversation, and this is what we've got to understand when we're reading the Bible. This is the same uh, a continuation of the conversation that Jesus is having. And he says in chapter, verse 1, These things I've spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. New King James Version. Okay, um, in the NIV it says that you shall not be made to fall away. All right, stumble. What is he saying? I, I, he says, well, look, I'm about to tell you something, and you, I want you to know about it, because when, when you know about it, that when it happens, you'll not sort of start doubting and start falling away and start having a, a lack of belief. Verse 2, they will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you 
will think that they are doing God's service. He's talking to his disciples. He says they're going to put you out of the synagogue. Synagogue, obviously, the, the gathering where the Jewish people used to be. He says they're going to come along, and they're going to put you out of the synagogue. Who was it that worshipped in the synagogue? Well, we all say, well, it was the Jews. It was the Jews, but there was different sects within the Jews. You had the Pharisee sect. You had the Sadducee sect. You had the Essenes uh, who came up from the who actually left Jerusalem and went to live down uh, by, by the Qumran caves. Uh, you had the zealot sect. There was lots of different uh, sects. You had the sect of believers in, in Christ. They were all allowed to come into the synagogue, and they were all welcome to worship in the traditional manner with the sacrifices. The difference, of course, was that the believers in Christ believed that he was the Messiah, where the other sects didn't believe that. So the time came when there was going to be a split, that they were going to be put out of the synagogue. And they were, he, he was warning them. He said, look, this is what's going to happen. You are going to be put out of the synagogue. And I want you to know this, because so that when it does happen, you won't be surprised. He was talking to his disciples at the time. And then he makes a, a very profound statement um, in, in verse 2. And he says, they will put you out of the synagogue, and the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that they were doing God's service. Well, who's he talking about? Well, you can see that this is a prophecy about Saul, the Apostle Paul, because he came along and he was, he was persecuting the Christians. He was pulling them from house to house. He was making sure they were stoned to death. And what did he, why did he do this? Because he believed that he was keeping Judaism as pure as, as he could be and he was doing God a service by getting rid of these guys who were basically heretics in his sight. In verse 3, he goes on, he says, And these things they will do to you, because they have not known the Father nor me. Now, wow, hold on. Surely the Jewish people know the Father? Even though they know Jesus, they've rejected him, but they do know the Father. What Jesus is talking about here is they don't know the Father as a father of relationship. They, they know him as a God who has said something and you've got to obey it. They know him that if you don't do what's good, that they, then you're going, to, you're, you're going to get something bad to you. They know that there are blessings and there are curses. They know that if you don't follow the law, then, then you, you're, you're, you're heading for trouble. They didn't, they didn't know Father uh, in a relationship. But these things I've told you, verse 4, that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. But now, verse 5, but now I go away to him who sent me. So he's saying, guys, this is what's going to happen. That, that, that you know, I'm, I've got to go. And, uh, and the, I'm going to send you a, the, a helper in the form of, of the person of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to know that you're going to be thrown out of, out of your, your, your local church, basically, uh, your synagogue. You're going to be thrown out of it. You're going to be persecuted. There are people going to want to kill you and think that they're doing God's service. Now, I didn't tell you this at the very beginning. Why? Because I was with you, and I was teaching you, and I was guiding you for all these three, three, three and a half years that I've been with you. I've been doing these things for you. But now the time is coming when I'm going. And then he goes on, and he makes a, a, a rather unusual statement. He says, and none of you asks me, where I was going. He said, none of you, you know, I'm, go I'm going to, I'm going, uh, uh, and you don't ask me where. Now, this is an unusual statement to make. One of the reasons is because that Peter did ask him, if we look at John chapter 13, Peter says, where are you going? And Jesus says, where I'm going, you cannot come. Peter says, no, I will, I'll follow you right until, until death. And Jesus said, no, 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 you won't, Peter, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. And then when we go into chapter 14, Thomas says to him, but where are you going? I don't understand. Can you explain? So why would Jesus then, why would he come along and he say that you haven't asked me? You see, what Jesus was, was actually, what he was pointing out to them, that they haven't grasped it. And I'm going to explain that a little bit later. First of all, we've got to understand that Jesus was talking to his disciples. Now, how many people follow Jesus? I can actually tell you there were, there were a lot of people who followed Jesus. There were a lot of people. They followed, they followed the Lord. And, and the disciples thought, well, the Holy Spirit's going to come to us. That's who it is. The majority of the, of the people who followed Jesus were women. 
and uh, they, 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 they not only followed him, but they also supported his ministry, the Bible tells us. He says, but when I go away, none of you ask me where you're, where, where you're going. But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. So what is he saying here? He's saying that, guys, what's happening here is that you haven't asked me because grief has taken you over. Sorrow has filled your, your heart. Your emotions are taking, are taking control of you. Now, what we've got to understand is that he's talking to the disciples. The disciples thought they were going to be exclusive. We're going to get the Holy Spirit. There's 11 of us left. Obviously, Judas is, is we're, we're, we're excluding him. There's, there's 11 of you here. The, you guys are going to get the Holy Spirit. They thought, well, we're going to get the Holy Spirit because we are the closest followers of Jesus. And then Pentecost comes along, and the Spirit of God is given. Now, if you, if you understand Pentecost, the Bible says that 3,000 people were added to the church on that day of Pentecost when the Spirit came down and landed on the people like cloven tongues of fire, and they, they spoke in other languages. And then 3,000 not only were added to the church, but they were also baptized in the mikvahs just outside the temple. That's what happened, 3,000. Now, you think this is when the Spirit was given. The Spirit, God said in Jeremiah 31, I'm going to give you a new covenant. That new covenant will be written in your heart. It will be within you. The old covenant under Moses, what happened? 3,000 people were killed because of the, the, the making the golden calf. So they came and they were, they, 3,000 died. And this 3,000 were saved. So you can see that, 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 that there's a flip side of what's going on here. And then, of course, if we go to see, we see that, first of all, all right, so it's, it's the 11 disciples. No, 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 now it's more. Now it's the people who believed on Pentecost. That, that was 3,000 got added from, but there were still Jewish people. And then what happened? Then we go into the book of Acts, and we see really what's going on there. We look at Acts chapter 10, and this is when, when Peter gets a vision, and, and Cornelius, who's a, a, an Italian, he's a Roman centurion, and the Bible says he's an Italian, and, and he gets this, this vision of an angel coming to him, and the, the, the angel says to, to, the, to Cornelius, I want you to send for a man called Simon, sometimes called Peter. I want you to go to him. He's staying at Simon the Tanner's house. Now, this vision happened in a place called Caesarea, which is on the, the uh, west coast of, of, of Israel. He said, go to Joppa. Joppa is further north. It's, it's actually where, where, uh, in, where Tel Aviv is today. And he said, I want you to go there, look for a man, and when you get him, bring him back. Send, send a soldier. So he sent two servants, two of his faithful servants, Cornelius, and a soldier to, to go and get him. Now, at the same time, Peter, he's in Simon the Tanner's house, and he went up on the roof to pray. Now, when we talk, think about roofs, we often think about slanted roofs and slate roofs. But in Israel, all, basically all the buildings, all the houses, all the roofs are flat. And the only difference, um, really, that I noticed between the, the roofs of that, that explained in, in ancient times and the roofs that I witnessed in, in Israel is that uh, today there's a lot of satellite dishes on them, whereas when then they, their connection would have been with, with God. But so, so Simon, uh, Peter goes up, up on, onto the roof to pray, and as he's up there, the Bible says he gets hungry, and as he gets hungry, he gets this vision, and the vision is a sheet comes down from heaven, a sheet from corner to corner comes all the way down from heaven, and in it, there's a lot of food. And a lot of the food that's there that, 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 that Peter was told he can go and eat from was unclean stuff. So I'm talking about pork, I'm talking about reptiles, I'm talking about things where they're not allowed to, to, to uh, the Jewish people are not allowed to eat. So the, the vision says, eat. Peter said, no, 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 I, I, I can't do that because I've never had unclean food. I've never done that. Um, so, you know, I, I, I would rather not do it. Then God says to him, don't call what I have cleansed, don't call what I have made clean, unclean. Peter didn't understand it. He was still pondering it. Meanwhile, at the gate of Simon and Tanner's house, we have the, 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 the soldier and two, the two servants looking for Peter. The, the spirit told Peter, that, go downstairs. There are people who are looking for you. When, they went, when he went downstairs, there the men were. And they said, you've got to come with us to Cornelius and, and Caesarea. So they, 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 Peter brought them in, made them guests in his house, which you know is pretty you know, unusual because... What you find is that the Jews were not allowed to mix uh, socially like this with, with Gentiles. 
Next day, they headed back out from Caesarea. Sorry, I keep wiping some sweat up, and it's very hot here today. Uh, they, they went, and they, they went from, from Joppa, and they went to, to Caesarea. And when they got to the centurion, the, to, to Cornelius, Cornelius already had invited a whole lot of friends, a whole lot of family there, and Peter went inside. And the, the, the Bible says he started to talk to them, to minister to them. Peter didn't even know why he was going there. He was just told by the Lord, I want you to go there. Once Peter started to talk to them, and the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they started speaking in other tongues, what did Peter realize? Peter realized what his vision had meant. He realized, wow, hold on a second. The Holy Spirit, we initially thought it was for 11 disciples. Then we thought it was for the 3,000. Then we thought it was for Jewish believers in, in Jesus. Now we see it's for every nation. It's for the Gentiles as well. It's for all, believe, all believers. It's spilled over from the first lot of disciples. It's spilled over into the 3,000. It's spilled over into all Jewish believers. Now it's spilling over into the whole world. You cannot contain the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will, will, is going to be all over the place from the furthest points from north to south, from east to west. It's going to be there, and it's going to be there for the people. And he's there to help. He's a helper. He's a comforter. He's an advocate. He's there to help each and every one of us. In fact, in Acts 1, Jesus says to them, I want you to go and I want you to minister in, in Jerusalem. I want you to go to Judea. I want you to go to Samaria. And I want you to go to all the ends of the earth. So it's, it sounds like as if it's, it's a geographical thing where you start where you are and then you work your way out to Judea and then further out to Samaria, then to the, all the ends of the earth. But really, the Spirit of God's not geographical. It is for every single person. It's for humanity. So nobody asked, and, and Peter, obviously, he did ask, and Thomas, he did ask. But what they did was they weren't understanding what Jesus was saying. I'm, I'm, where are you going? Jesus says, I'm going to go to the Father. I'm going to have the relationship with, back with my Father. You see, they had been given into sorrow. They have been given into grief. And, and that's the difficult part of, of being a, a, a human being. The difficult part of being a human being is understanding other people. Um, it, it, it's, it's easy for us to react to other people. We can dislike, we can get angry, we can get emotional. Uh, we can think they're funny, we can do all sorts of things. We, we can react, but understanding is hard because you've got to understand. They, Understand other people. Understand what makes them think. Understand why you particularly maybe not like this particular person. Just try to understand them. That's the difficult part. They couldn't understand where Jesus was going. They couldn't understand what he was telling them about in the spiritual world where he's going to be. They couldn't understand it. They couldn't grasp it. And that's our problem. It's our problem today when we don't understand other people. It's, it's, everything's focused around us. We think everything sort of revolves around us, but we've got to learn that we must understand and we must then look at ourselves. Paul says we must examine ourselves. If every problem that you have in your life that you will go through, that you are going through, if every problem in your life is you, you're blessed. You know why that is? Because you can change. You can do something about it. You can examine yourself. You can say, why is my attitude like that? Why do I do that? But if the problem is someone else, if the problem is the world, if the problem is the system of the world, if the problem is all the governments or, and, and they're doing things that you don't agree with, if that is the problem, there's nothing you can do about it. The only thing you can do something about is yourself. You examine yourself and you look. Now, in verse 7, he continues, he says, Jesus says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Wow, that's, that's kind of hard to swallow, isn't it? Yeah. If you're walking along with Jesus and you're doing all sorts of stuff with Jesus and, and, and you see him doing miracles and, and feeding the 5,000 and walking on water and healing the sick, and he says it's to your advantage. They must have thought, mm, maybe... How can that be their advantage? He says, it can be to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if you depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world. All right, so I, I don't want to go too, too much further there. But he says, it is good. It, 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 you're you're going to be better off. You're going to be better off without me. Can you imagine? 
Can you imagine telling someone you're going to be better off without Jesus? Why? Because the Holy Spirit's going to come. Does that, what does that mean? It means that the Holy Spirit is actually going to come in, in the presence, as, as, as the presence of Jesus. But he's going to come to you, and there's going to be a big difference. He's going to give you the boldness. He's the one. He's the advocate. He's the one that's going to show you the way. He's the one that's going to point to Jesus. He's the one that speaks about the truth. He is the spirit of truth, and he will be talking about Jesus. Now, how is that going to happen? Well, we, we saw when Jesus was, was, got the Holy Spirit, when he crossed the River Jordan, the heavens opened and a dove like came down, and the voice said, this is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased, and he was anointed by the Spirit of God. Jesus is now saying, just as the Father released the Spirit on me, I'm going to release the Spirit on the church. What a blessing that is. We often, we misunderstand what that Holy Spirit is about. It is a blessing to our church. The Holy Spirit, He is a blessing to this church, to our church, to all the churches throughout the world, to all believers. The Holy Spirit is a blessing. Jesus was a, Jesus, this is my beloved son. Jesus, you never heard Jesus querying that. Well, Father, I'm not so sure if I'm your son or not. Uh, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. We often query it. We, we often, as believers, we actually, well, well, I'm not sure if I'm saved or uh, we've been taught to believe that, oh, yeah, if you sin during the week, then you've got to get saved again and then you can fall. No. Once the Spirit comes, the Spirit of God doesn't just fall on you. We often think it, it, it lands on us, works its way into us, and then while it's into us, we will work out our salvation and then that's when the fruit will come out of us. It doesn't work like that. The Spirit of God will come and come into you, into your hearts. I am giving you a new covenant inside your inner being. That's where the Spirit of God comes. And that's what we must realize. And that's what we must do. We're not in and out of the church. We're not in and out of God. We have got a relationship with the Father. We are His children. Do we make mistakes? Of course we do. Those of you who have got kids know that your children make mistakes, but they're still your children. I've made mistakes, but I was still my father's child. We've got to understand that that is it. The Holy Spirit comes, and it comes within you. Now, we often, um, in various churches, you know, we've got different denominations, and, and it, 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 you know, it, we look at, at various churches, and some churches believe in, in, in the operation of the gifts, and some churches don't believe in the operation of the gifts. Sometimes we see the operation of the gifts. Sometimes we don't see the oper operation of the gifts. But you see, the thing is this, what we've got to understand, we've got to understand other people. We've got to understand how they are and understand why they think that way. And we've got to accept them. You know, one of the, one of the biggest problems that I'm going to mention just now is how we don't tolerate other people other people you know we, we we look at denominations we almost look at them as if it's a it's our club you know we're right and they're wrong and you know you know their doctorate you know, that's that's something else we're not going to look at that and um, we often think the holy spirit is oh it's when we when there's our spirit's going to move this guy's going to get healed this is going to do someone's going to get struck down they're going to be slain in the spirit and we often look for signs now i'm not saying there isn't signs and wonders there are, of course there are signs and wonders but i've often we, we we often have that feeling today that you know what uh, back in those days in, in the book of acts and, and when jesus said he's going to send the helper that the holy spirit then was real it was pure it was like you know the stronger now we've got a diluted version no we haven't we haven't got a diluted version because Jesus said he was going to send the helper. He was going to send it. Now, all we have to do is receive it. We receive the Spirit of God. We just receive it. And we, we receive it when we come to faith in Christ. Now, some, uh, as I mentioned the last time, some of us come to faith in Christ and there's no fireworks. It's not like Apostle Paul where we go blind and we, there's a great light. Some of us are brought up in church and in, in, in Christian houses, and there's no great big difference, but, uh, but we do believe. Well, that's your testimony. That's what you have to do. It's not a case where the Spirit's going to come along and, and do all sorts of, of miraculous things he may do, but it's not imperative that he does. I'll give you an example. In the Old Testament, they, they're always looking for signs. They saw the Red Sea being uh, uh, divided. 
they saw water coming from a rock. They got manna in the wilderness. Their clothes never wore out. Their sandals never wore out. They saw that if they looked at the bronze snake, they got healed. There was a whole lot. Of, I was always, always looking for signs and wonders. And sometimes in, in the Christian life, we were always looking for signs and we're always looking for wonders. But I want to tell you, in the Old Testament, you've got the prophet Elijah. And he says, Lord, they're coming to kill me. He says, well, okay, here's what I want you to do. Stand outside. And then he stood outside and there was a ferocious wind. And the wind almost blew Elijah off his feet. And Elijah must have thought, wow, Lord, this is amazing. And then the Bible says, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. And then there was an earthquake that shattered. You know, this earth splits open. And Elijah must have thought, gee, Lord, this is amazing. But the Bible says the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And then there was a fire. Oh, Lord, that's so hot. It, it's so hot. The Bible says that the Lord wasn't in the fire. And then there was a still, small voice. That was the voice of God. And that is the Holy Spirit. It's the voice of God. It's a relationship. It's not something that God's got to prove to you. It's not something that you've got to say, well, this is what I'm, yeah, I'm looking for proof. And Jesus said, um, he didn't say, come on to me, all ye that have got leprosy. Or come unto me, all ye that are sick, and I will I will give you healing. He said, to me, "Come unto me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden with the worries of this world." He says, "And I will give you rest." And that's what we should be looking for. We should be looking for rest. You see, it's so popular um, for to see the healings, to see the miracles, to see what well, it's so popular. I mean, you see great big banners for crusades come expect a healing um, and it gets exciting and people you know you go there and you see people throwing crutches away and jumping up out of wheelchairs and wow this is really something else but we've got to trust not just not in the visible but in the invisible not in the tangible but in the untangible we've got the we've got the still small voice that comes us yeah see it's not so not it's not so attractive when you just say you know what you just got to believe and God will give you the peace. He will give you the rest that you're looking for. Okay, so the intent of the Holy Spirit is to actually embrace you with a relationship so that you, like Jesus, this is my beloved son, so that you know that you are actually a son or a daughter of Father God. That's what the Holy Spirit there. It's there for, to give you the peace, to give you the rest for the, that you know some some people say that the gifts are not for the church today. Some people say that, you know what, um, I don't believe that women can teach in church um, because uh, the Bible says, and they'll throw a thousand scriptures at you, that, that, and you know what, like I said earlier, that most of the followers of Jesus were, were women. The, 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 the first one to see him from the tomb was Mary Magdalene. The, the, the one who went, uh, the lady at the well, she went and was the, uh, evangelized um, to the rest of the town. And we look in the Old Testament and we see one of, one of the judges was, was, was Deborah. And um, when you start telling God what he can do and what he can't do with the spirit, you're on dangerous ground. Oh, it's not for the, no, no, we don't think it's for, the, it's for the church. Let God do it. Let him. You know, we spend so much time maybe criticizing other people, pointing fingers Instead of getting on and spreading the word of God and trying to give people peace of mind, not being antagonistic and not, you're not defending the faith, you're arguing over petty, petty doctrines. The important thing is to accept Christ into your life and for you to have that peace, not to take up the sword and run around and try and, and, and uh, cut apart other people who are, who are ministering for God. Like Elijah said, I'm the only one left. He says, no, you're not. I've got a lot left, there's thousands left. See, the overflow of the Spirit came from the disciples to the Jewish people, from, to, from the Jewish people that came to, to the Gentiles. You cannot put the Holy Spirit in a box and tell him what he's going to... You cannot tell God what he's allowed to do, what he's not allowed to do. You can't do that. It's not for today. We cannot limit God. We cannot do it. God will do whatever miracles he sees fit to do. Why? Because he's God. So what does he want? He wants a relationship. He want, God wants a relationship with humanity. And for us to know, for us, us believers, to know he's our father. He 
he's, he's our father. He wants a relationship with us. The Holy Spirit testifies about the truth. The truth is the purpose of Jesus. What was the purpose of Jesus? It was to reconcile mankind to God. And that's what the Holy Spirit's work is. His work is in you to reconcile you, to give you the peace, to be your helper, to be your advocate, to be the one who's there for you, to be the one who's alongside you. The Holy Spirit is there to help you. The Holy Spirit's not there to give you a, a smack over the head when you think you've done something wrong. He's there to help you. You see, the Holy Spirit is to reconcile mankind to our Heavenly Father. Next time I'm ministering, we were going to look at verse 8 through, and it talks about the King James Version says, and the Holy Spirit's job is to convict. And verse 8, I'm just going to read verse 8. And when he, can, when he has come, when he has come, remember, a he, it's the Holy Spirit, it's a person. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. Okay, now we're going to examine that. We're going to look to see what does that word convict mean? And where do we fit into the whole thing? And what, what we've got to worry about? And well, once we understand it, and we will realize that, you know what? We've got nothing to worry about because we've got God is for us. Who can be against us? Amen. God bless for now. I'll see you soon.